Today, I wanted to create an in-depth tutorial to teach all of you at home how I record my screen. Now, this may sound like the kind of thing that is pretty straightforward, but trust me, folks, there is an actual art to this stuff, and I'm going to teach it to you. Coming up next on Tech Talk America. Hey folks, and welcome to the class. You know, I have been recording my screen for years now, and over time, I have tried using several different applications to both record and edit that footage. And the fact of the matter is, is that depending on what types of videos you are looking to create, the best solution for you may be completely different for someone else. I wanted to start this video by suggesting a few options for those of you out there who have very basic screen recording needs. If you are totally new to creating video content and you just need a simple solution that you can learn quickly, I would recommend that you check out apps like ScreenFlow, Filmora, or Camtasia. Of those three, I'd probably show a slight preference for ScreenFlow, but like I said, all of them are pretty easy to use and I'll put links to all three in the video description. Now, if you'd ever like me to do an in-depth tutorial about any one of those apps, just let me know about it down below in the comments section. At this point, I would like to start to share my process with all of you. And before we get into things like software and editing, the first thing that I want to do is share with you a little realization that I had a few years ago. Like most people, I have found that I tend to do a better job at something when I only focus on doing one thing at a time. So whenever I make videos that include a screen recording, I actually record all of the voiceovers first. The screen recording takes place during a separate recording session. I think most people would agree that one of the worst things that any presenter can do is to slip into saying, um, uh, and those other noises that you make when your brain is trying desperately to both talk about something while doing something and also thinking about whatever is coming up ahead. Some people can do that. I'm not one of them. Now, depending on the topic, sometimes I do script out every single word. Other times, I just hit the record button and see what comes out. The point here is that I master the audio first. Now, when it comes to the equipment for recording this stuff, for the last two years, I have been using the Blue Yeti Pro as my main voiceover mic. What I love about it is that it's not outrageously expensive, and if you do decide to pick one up, I would also recommend that at some point you get a pop filter and some sort of a flexible arm so that you can clamp it down onto your desk and easily reposition it as needed. So when I'm done recording my voiceover, I then export that audio as a simple MP3 file, which gets played back into my headphones when I record the screen. That way, as I'm recording my screen, I know the exact pacing at which to go through every single step. And that saves me a ton of time later on in editing. When it comes to recording the screen itself, the good news is you don't need anything fancy. In fact, I just use the built-in screen recording feature that now comes built into every Mac. By the way, just in case you didn't know, provided your Mac is relatively up to date, the new way that you can access those controls is by pressing Command Shift 5 on your keyboard. When you do, you'll see this type of a screen appear, and these two buttons here on the bottom right are specifically for capturing video. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that most editors will probably agree with me that one of the most tedious aspects of editing is having to blur out things like names, email addresses, phone numbers, etc. And for that reason, anytime I record my screen, I always do it from a separate user account which is dedicated to screen recording. I suggest you do the same. Here's another trick to help improve your workflow. The default settings to save your screen recording will save it to the desktop. But what I would recommend that you do is change that to the shared folder. The reason why is any other user on your Mac can access anything that's saved into that folder. So when you go to import your footage from whatever editing software you use, you can just point it to that location. Now, when it comes to adding effects like zooming in or out of the screen, for that, I use a really simple plugin that works with Final Cut Pro. Now, if you have never used Final Cut Pro, I encourage you to watch my 90-minute free class. It's very thorough, and even if you think you know Final Cut, who knows, you might pick up a few new tricks. You can watch that class, by the way, by clicking on the card icon that just appeared right above my head, or of course, I'll put a link to it down below in the video description. Over the years, I have amassed a little collection of plugins, but there are definitely some that I use more than others. The one that I use the most these days is called MTuber. 
and the company that makes it recently released a new version, appropriately named MTuber 2. In my opinion, I think both actually do have their own value, but I use the original probably a little bit more than the newer one. Now, even if you're not making YouTube videos, these two plugins have the exact types of tools and effects that appeal to a very wide range of uses. I'll put links to both of them down below in the video description, and to show you how to use those plugins, let's now switch to my Mac. Here in Final Cut Pro, I have loaded a screen recording which we're going to use just for demonstration purposes. Let's say that the first thing I want to do is have it zoom into a portion of the screen. At this point, I'll just open up my title effects, and here in MTuber, let's drag where it says Zoom Full, and let's drop it right on top of this shot. Now, as you can see, my effect is represented by this purple bar. In order to configure where I want it to zoom in, I'll just make sure that my playhead is somewhere in the middle of this shot. Then we can go here into the inspector and click right into the X and Y coordinates. I can drag up and down on my cursor to make any necessary adjustments. I can also do the same thing here where it says zoom scale. Now, as of right now, when our playhead reaches the end of that bar, it's going to automatically pull back so that we're at our original position so that we can see the full screen. But what if you want to add a second movement so that it zooms into a different portion of the screen? That is where keyframing comes into play. So let's say after hovering on this spot for two seconds, I then want it to move to a different part of the screen. All I need to do to extend the effect is to drag this side out to the right. Now I'm going to place the playhead at the point where it's going to begin the movement to the second location. At this point, we'll go here into the inspector and we're going to click on these little diamond icons that represent a new keyframe. If you're also going to change how far zoomed in you are, you're also going to need to create a new keyframe where it says zoom scale. The next step is we need to define how long is it going to take to transition from here to our next location. So at this point, I would like to teach you a little shortcut. If you press the shift key and the right arrow key, that will advance the playhead 10 frames. If we look at the top of this project, you'll see that currently we are filming this at 30 frames per second. So if I want it to take one second to move from point A to point B, that means that we need to advance the playhead 30 frames. Or we can hold the shift key and tap the right arrow three times. Now we can make the adjustments to our shot to change the positioning, and there you go, it's animated. Another trick I wanted to show you is how to make adjustments to keyframes. Maybe this transition from point A to point B needs to happen a little bit faster. And rather than undoing everything that we've already done, here's another handy hotkey. If you press Control and the letter V as in Victor, while clicked on the effect, it will open it up so that now we can see and make adjustments to keyframes. So if I need this to transition more quickly, I can just drag it back a little bit. Another trick that I wanted to show you is how to make elements like titles that contain placeholders for logos automatically preload with your logo. To make this happen, we're going to navigate to where that placeholder file lives and then we're gonna swap it out with your logo. Now, if you get lost during this part, don't worry, I will put written directions in the video description about how to find this location. We're gonna start by going into the Movies folder, and then we're gonna open up this folder called Motion Templates. Next, we'll go into Titles, then MTuber. Now, if you decide to purchase MTuber 2, obviously you'll need to repeat this step with that folder. We're now going to go into Titles, and finally, Media. The file that we are going to replace is called your underscore logo underscore white. You may want to consider checking out some of those other placeholder images here in this folder and swap those out as well. But for me, this is the one that I end up using all the time, and it's usually for my videos, so it is my logo that I'm using over and over again. So at this point, I'll just copy and paste my logo into this folder, delete the old file, and rename this file so that it now has the same name as the old file, which again was your underscore logo underscore white. And now when we switch back to Final Cut Pro, check it out. 
anytime I use any of these titles, my logo is already loaded and good to go. If this video helped you, please be sure to hit that little thumbs up like button, leave me a comment down below, and if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching everyone. This is David A. Cox with Tech Talk America. Class dismissed.